I'm Guido Lobrano, Director General for Europe at ITI, the Global Association of the Tech Industry. Welcome to our discussion on the EU Data Act. As you know, the Data Act is a legislative proposal by the European Commission that touches upon several aspects of the data economy. Today, we will be discussing especially the aspects related to data access and use. Our goal for the session is to reflect on what it means to have a fair data economy and how the Data Act can be balanced and proportionate for all the actors. We are very pleased to have um, with us for this conversation, Mr. Ivo Folman. Uh, Ivo, thanks for joining us. Mr. Folman leads the Data Directorate in DigiConnect at the European Commission. Ivo and his team have been leading the efforts of the European Commission in data policy for several years. Um, and more recently, he has worked on the follow-up to the February 2020 EU data strategy, including the Data Governance Act, as well as the Data Act that we'll be discussing today. So Ivo, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Hello, good afternoon. Very happy to be here. <clears throat> Before moving to our discussion uh, and the questions for Ivo, I'd like to remind you all uh, in the audience that we are also streaming today's sessions live on YouTube's um, ITI's channel. Um, and uh, you know, before we go to the many questions that I think all of us have on the Data Act, let me maybe say a few words on our outlook on the proposal. Uh, ITI as an organization is the premier global advocate for technology, representing the world's most innovative companies. Our membership includes manufacturers of connected products, data processing service providers, software providers, and many other tech and tech-enabled businesses who are key to the data economy. The Data Act proposal that Mr. Holman and his colleagues have been developing lays out uh, very ambitious rules to bolster data sharing and data use. It creates a, a right for users of connected products to access the data they generate and to share it with third parties. Now, growing data volumes and technological advancement improve every aspect of our lives, uh, from IoT devices and AI to personalized products and services and more efficient resource use and energy consumption, data is crucial for the digital transformation. Our industry um, has been supporting the goals of improving data access and sharing. We have always been supportive of voluntary schemes to incentivize data sharing between businesses based on industry best practices. However, mandating data, um, mandating data sharing poses a lot of questions related to protection of trade secrets, access to information, as well as safeguards to companies' investment in data innovation. Trade secrets and IP in particular should also be adequately protected to preserve these investments and sensitive information. Now, the Data Act regulates also international transfers of non-personal data from Europe. Non-personal data does not pose the same risk to fundamental rights as personal data, and as such, the free flow of data across borders in the tech industry perspective should not be restricted. Uh, these data flows are the lifeblood of the digital economy and restricted them would harm the global competitiveness of businesses in the EU. So it is key that uh, a legislative framework for data sharing creates legal certainty, preserves economic incentives for companies and ensures that the rights of all the actors involved are protected. Now, as the European co-legislators are preparing to start the discussions on the Data Act. We are very thrilled to have this opportunity today for an exchange with Ivo Volman from the European Commission. We have a global audience with participants uh, that have joined us from all corners inside and outside of Europe. So Ivo, if you're ready, um, let's maybe begin by looking at one of the central goals of the initiative, uh, which is that of promoting fairness in the data economy. For our data intensive industry, it is fundamental that a fair data economy preserves market incentives and stimulates companies' investment in innovation without mandating data sharing. Uh, so I'm sure you know, we will have a lot of discussion on this. But to get us started, maybe how about you make a brief introduction of the Data Act and explain how the provisions on data sharing will ensure fairness in the data economy. Yeah, no, many thanks, Guido, for that question. And uh, let me first give a bit of context, which is actually the data strategy that you mentioned, and that was published um, in February 2020. Now, there is a vision behind the data strategy of data circulating between countries and between sectors. 
there being ample of data available for use and reuse, uh, data being um, processed and being used in full respect of European values, including uh, privacy, and there being clear rules about who can access and use data. Now, um, the data strategy, including the vision, was strongly endorsed politically by the European Council, also by the European Parliament. And well, uh, you explained why data is so important, so I'm not going to do it again, but it's clear that there's a lot of political interest uh, for making data work better for the economy and society. Now, the data strategy is not just about legislation. It's also about investments, investment in data technologies, investments in data infrastructures. So there is a, a comprehensive plan that combine, combines actually the governance and legislation with uh, investments. And also there is this idea of developing common European data spaces. At the same time that we published the proposal for a data act, we came out with a staff working document that sets out the next steps for the common European data spaces. That may be an interesting one to, to look at. Now, at the end of the day, we think that Europe should really be able to, to benefit from the value of its industrial data. And we need to act now to make it happen. Okay, then let me go to the, to the data act. The, the data act um, is the second main legislative instrument uh, of the data strategy that we put on the table. So the first one was the Data Governance Act, and we've got that one practically in place. It was agreed in less than a year uh, by the co-legislators. Now, the Data Governance Act is about trust in data sharing, voluntary data sharing, as you indicated. So how do we want to achieve that? We want to achieve that by regulating the intermediaries, who bring the supply and demand of data together in different constellations. So that's what the Data Governance Act did. Now then about the Data Act. That is indeed about fairness, fairness in the data economy, because there is new value in data. We know, all of us know that, and everyone would actually like to capture the whole value of the data. And if we don't sort out who gets part of the value of the data, then the overall data cake um, will be smaller. The data will simply be less used. So that, that's a problem. And that is the issue that we're looking at in the Data Act. Now, this is, for example, the case for uh, data that is generated by connected objects, all kinds of smart objects in our households, right? Smart solar panels, smart dishwashers, cleaning robots, etc. But also all kinds of objects used in industry, factory robots, harvesting machines, building equipment, et cetera, et cetera. More and more of that is, is connected. It produces data and things used to be so simple in the past. You, you bought an object and the object was yours and everything that came with it was yours. But how does that work for data? The data that's produced by this object, is that yours or is that actually um, some kind of property of the manufacturers? Now, that has been an issue for, for years, uh, and perhaps even third parties should have some access rights to that, like third parties who can offer uh, repair services. Now, things are simply not clear in this respect, right? So what we do with the Data Act is to create possibilities for the users of the connected objects, the owners of the connected objects, to actually access the data, to give the data to third parties, for example, for these aftermarket services. But at the same time, the manufacturers keep the possibility to use the data and to protect the data where that's necessary. So we have indeed very carefully looked at, at the balance of the interest between the different stakeholders. It's based on years of discussions and, and experience from all the different sectors. And we think that we have found the, the right balance that combines on the one hand incentives to continue investing in these data generating objects, but at the same time also increase the data use, um, the data use by actually the uh, users of the objects for different purposes, including um, yeah, new services that can be based on the data.
thanks thanks for that answer i mean that opens um, i think a whole lot of of other you know thoughts and questions uh maybe before going there uh just wanted to mention that uh, later in the hour, we will be opening the discussion to incorporate your questions from the audience, the people that are listening in. So to answer a question, to ask a question, enter it into the Q&A box. Uh, please use the Q&A and not the chat, uh, and then click send. Uh, and as always, uh, I would encourage you to engage with us during and after the discussion on Twitter at ITI underscore tech tweets. Uh, now, Ivo, as, as, as you pointed out, you know, the Data Act aims to remove barriers to data sharing, allowing users to access and use the data that they generate, um, and imposes on data holders to make data available to third parties upon a user request. Uh, so could you help our audience capture the scope of these obligations? Could you tell us more on you know, the, the types of data, the, the data cake, as you, as you referred to it before, uh, and also the products that will be covered by these access rights that are introduced by the proposal? Yeah, no, no, thanks for that. So no, indeed, so the Data Act will give uh, the users of connected objects more control. So what types of products are, are covered? Um, it's all products that obtain, collect and generate data about performance, about the user or about the environment in which the product is, is used and um, that are able to transmit the data over public networks. Well, the internet of things. So basically that's, that's the core. So it can be uh, vehicles, it can be home equipment, it can be consumer goods, it can be medical and health devices, it can be agricultural or industrial machinery. Now, what is actually not covered is products who have as a primary function to, to process or to store data. Uh, or to, to display or play content. So personal computers are not covered. Tablets are not covered. Cameras are not, not covered. Now, we also often get the question, uh, yeah, does this uh, cover both personal and non-personal data? Uh, since we have the GDPR, so is, is, is um, personal data covered? Yes, um, the proposal covers both personal and, and non-personal data. So there's different types of data that that can be, can be covered in, in this respect. Maybe let's let's focus on that for a moment. Um, and you know, of course, uh, as you pointed out, there are already several instruments that are regulating data protection and its use uh, in the European Union. Uh, the line between what is personal and what is non-personal data is, is not always demarcated, especially when it comes to data that are generated by consumers. So could you maybe provide some insights on the interplay between personal data protection legislation like the GDPR and the Data Act? Um, if you know, a few details on that would be, I think, great. Yeah, no, so first of all, the Data Act is about economic rights. So it's not a, a data protection instrument. So it, it further empowers uh, consumers in the digital economy and, and more in general users of uh, connected objects. So again, it's not a data protection instrument, but given that it touches upon personal data, there is a, a natural interaction with the GDPR. So first of all, the, the data act is fully consistent with, and it complements the GDPR rules. So we're not proposing any measure that would change or interfere with the, the personal data protection legislation. Uh, in the Data Act. Um, now, what, what is happening in the Data Act is actually that the portability right that exists in the GDPR Article 20 is being strengthened in practice um, in relation to data that come from the connected objects. So the improved portability of the data coming from these objects will cover both personal and non-personal data, but given that we have Article 20 GDPR in place, um, there is actually an enhancement of the possibilities that you would have under Article 20 to get some of the data already. Um, and um, again, no change to the GDPR, but complementing and enriching the portability right that is, that is already there. Thanks for that clarification. And I see that we're already having a few questions coming through in the Q&A. We'll, we'll get to those in a moment. And thanks, and please continue to send us your questions. Um, 
maybe we can stay for a moment on the data access mechanism and you know the, the user rights, which are in chapter two of, of the proposal. They, they greatly rely on the role of users as the one exercising the right to access the data that they generate or requesting that their data is made available to a third party. Can you provide some details and examples of the situations that you've been thinking where you envision a user exercising this right? Um, what are the incentives for users to share data with third parties? Yeah, so indeed, as you say, the, the data is constructed around a user-centric approach uh, to this access and, and use right. And uh, concretely, what kind of services could you get as a user? Well, you could get more individ individualized repair and, and servicing. Um, you could have uh, your products repaired at more competitive prices uh, because you can give uh, the data to uh, third parties that actually offer repair services in competition with, with the manufacturer, for example. Um, you could also have data analytics services that are based on the data um, and that will uh, help you to improve your production if you're, if you're a company. Or you could get uh, personalized services that help you have a better diet if you um, basically give your data that comes from, uh, from a smartwatch. Now, um, overall, um, the impact assessment shows that there is an enormous potential in this uh, kind of uh, extra services. And the, um, uh, the study, the support study that actually uh, looked into this came with a, a quite staggering amount of 270 billion of additional GDP by 2000. 28 that could be generated if uh, this is this is fully uh, implemented well overall the greater availability of data uh, across the eu is going to create many opportunities uh, in particular for smes uh, this the data act can be seen as a real sme instrument and we think that it will be smes that will benefit but not only it's of course also all the companies that have the um, connected objects, also all the consumers that can get better services um, and, and can be serviced better based on the data that they, they generate. Now, um, sometimes there is this question, um, shouldn't you make a real difference between consumers and businesses? So is the B2C situation actually the same as the B2B situation? Well. Yes, um, at the end of the day, this is about control over the data you generate and the possibility to do something with the data because you have bought an object, right? It's again, the old situation of skill. You had an object and well, it was yours. Now what happens if you buy an object should be very similar in similar cases. And, and I think that's an important principle. Now, obviously the interaction with certain other legislation may be different whether you're in a b2b situation or a b2c uh, situations in the latter case the consumer law kicks in for example in a, in, a, in a different way but i think there is huge similarities and that's why we're treating uh, these issues in the same chapter of the of the data act So that is actually a question I was about to ask you about, you know, the potential differences between the B2B and the consumer uh, user perspective. Um, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat that I see about the scope. And I think, you know, it might make sense to look at them now before we move forward. Um, and so for example, one of our, one of our guests is asking, uh, referring to, some product examples that you mentioned that are outside of the scope of the act um, because they are primarily designed to display or play content. And this, um, this attendee is asking about smart TV and you know, is there a reason for this exclusion? Are there some products that are partly in or partly out? That's a very interesting question. Yeah. Um... Smart TVs are, would be in principle uh, part of the category of products that are not in. Um, are there products that are partly in and partly out? 
um, I would say that uh, voice assistants are partly in and partly out. Um, it's the data that come from the voice assistants, for example, your, your, your Spotify playlist would not be in, but in situations where actually the voice assistants are orchestrating the connected objects in your home, um, they would be in. So in that sense, voice assistants are partly in and, and are, are partly out. So I think this covers another question that we have from our audience on standalone services, um, where the person is asking data generated by consumption of content online, for example, are they covered or not? And so I think you, you just, just answered. No, that. they're not covered. Um, so let, let's go back to you know, our uh, you know, keeping track of the different topics. <clears throat> um, you know, if we look at the broad access and the use rights in the data acts, for, for the tech industry, it is fundamental to safeguard the trade secrets and IP, as I mentioned at the beginning. And the proposal contains some of these references to the protection of trade secrets. But could you talk a little bit more about how this protection will be ensured in practice? Yeah, no, no, thanks for this question. Indeed, it, it's really essential to adequately protect trade secrets. Now, we want to spur innovation and, and we don't want to make it easy to spy on competitors. Uh, that, that, is, that is the basis. Um, having said that, the protection, the protection of trade secrets per se should not undermine the exercise of the right to get access to the data by, by the user. So that that means that a request for access to the data, it cannot be simply refused because of a claim that the data is covered by uh, trade secrets. So we looked very carefully into this with our colleagues in DG Grow, who are responsible for the trade secrets. And it's clear that we are not talking here about an open data situation. Huh? It, it's not as if the data is, is out there. So in the situation where the user of an object gets access to the data, uh, in case there are trade secrets involved, the data holder and the user can agree on measures, on measures to preserve the, the confidentiality of the shared data, um, in particular in relation to third parties and, and what data can go to third parties. Now, then there is another situation where a third party actually gets access to the data under Article 5 of the, of the proposal, for example, for this aftermarket service example that, that I gave. And there, the data that are trade secrets shall, shall only be disclosed if this is strictly necessary for um, the purposes agreed between the user of the connected objects and the, and the third party. So for delivering this aftermarket service. Also, normally there will be an agreement uh, between the data holder and the third party, where the nature of the data that uh, can be considered as trade secrets, as well as what are the measures that the third party should take to prevent um, that actually the trade secrets are spilled out or to preserve the confidentiality shall be specified. Now, finally, um, in the proposal, there are uh, contractual and technical avenues for manufacturers and also for third parties to explore um, when determining how trade secrets should be protected when shared. Here I am, sorry, I was <clears throat> scrolling through the many questions that are coming through the chat. There is a lot of interest. Um, so he, here's another one. Um, on you know, one of the limitations in is that both users and third parties will have to respect in the use of the data received is the prohibition for the third party to develop a product that competes with the product from which the data originated. And we are, of course, very interested in understanding how this would work in practice, what criteria will be used to establish whether two products are in competition, how can a data holder ensure that the data recipient is not developing a competitive product? Uh, you know, and sometimes there are situations that are a bit in between where uh, maybe there are products that are in development but haven't been placed on the market yet, um, or situations where a service developed by the data holder becomes a competitor to the third party only after having shared the data. You have any thoughts on you know, these different scenarios? Yeah. No, that, that's, that's an interesting area indeed. Now, so first of all, 
why do we have this prohibition to develop a product? It's a product and not, not a service that competes with the product from which the data originated. Uh, this is a safeguard for the manufacturer. So it, it places a limit on the, the data recipients to um, actually do things on the basis of this access right that, that, uh, that gave you the data, right? So what we don't want is that the user or that a third party can use the data to make um, actually the same product that is already there and to, to use the data to compete directly with the manufacturer, that would not be fair. So we don't want uh, producing, to make producing a copycat uh, a legitimate practice, right? So this is really about fostering innovation by developing new services. This is not about uh, spying on uh, manufacturers and then actually doing in a cheaper way what they are already doing. Right, so that is what we're trying to stop. Now, uh, we looked at this very carefully with our DigiComp colleagues. Um, and how does this work in practice? Now, there are established competition law concepts that, that will really help determine uh, which products are seen as competing uh, between themselves. And this also applies to the question of whether products have been developed independently. That's actually at the basis of your question, right? It's a product that is in development, uh, has not been placed on the market, market yet. And then you couldn't do it because you've got the data. Now, obviously, um, that is not the type of situations that we're, that we're trying to cover. What we're trying to avoid is, is the copycat uh, model. Now, um, the data holder, the manufacturer, cannot invoke this prohibition to actually hold back the data, right? It should not hinder the development of new products and services in the aftermarket in itself. But what is the protection for the manufacturer? You will find that in Article 11 of the proposal, a data recipient that is giving false information about how the data will be used, well, they will not only have to destroy the data, but they also have to take uh, from production and from the market any products that are based on this use that was done, done under a false pretext, right? So there, there is a pretty strong protection measure. Maybe in relation to, to this, um, and aside from the prohibition to develop a competing service, are there other limitations regarding what users will be able to do with the data that they access? Um, will there be some kind of contractual agreement to enforce those? No, so um, in Article 4, the exercise of the, of the rights is dependent on a, on a simple user request. So there is no further requirements of having things specified in, in the agreement. Um, of course, unless there is a need to agree on, on measures to preserve the confidentiality of data, uh, we talked about the, uh, the trade secrets, for example, um, in that case, there, there can be an agreement on, on what, needs to, what needs to be done. But in principle, there is no need for a contractual agreement for the, um, for the user of the object to actually trigger the access to the data. Um, what is interesting is actually the other way around. Um, there is in the Data Act a transparency obligation for the, uh, the data holders to actually be able to use uh, the data. So it's the manufacturer that uses the data coming from the objects. They should indicate upfront uh, before the sale of the product, what use they're going to make of the data that's generated by the users of the data. Now, normally this would also be part of the contract uh, that is then actually uh, made between the, the manufacturer and the, and the data user. But the other way around, um, no, there's no obligation to have an agreement between the data user and the data holder. Thanks for that clarification. And since you, since you mentioned those, um, there is a question in the chat from Mario Romao. He's asking how to distinguish data generated uh, versus data that are derived or inferred. Uh, and you know, the comment is the data that are derived or inferred seem to be out of the scope of the Data Act based on the recitals. 
Well, <clears throat> what, what you don't want is that um, all kinds of data that have been processed already by the manufacturer would become data that is actually uh, uh, part of data that can be accessed because that would, would really lead to, to a competition issue there. So that is the, the reason why we make this, this distinction. Uh, this is about the raw data that comes from the object and that can be used for all kinds of new kinds of services. This is not about um, taking away all the extra work done by the, by the manufacturers um, also through their, their algorithms um, to actually give that data to a competitor. So that's the that's the reasoning behind it. Thanks, and this is clearly you know a very very important point for the industry. You know the investment that uh, firms put into um, developing, collecting, um, processing the data. That that is something that you feel very strongly needs to be protected. Of course, um, there is a, I think you know a, a list of other questions, and some of them are also starting to touch upon another angle of the proposal, which is about business to government sharing. So maybe we can turn to that. Um, but, you know, we know that the, the proposal says that the data holder would have to share data with a public sector body in case of exceptional need. Um, and you know, it, it's clearly very important that there is a possibility, there is a need to share data with public bodies in order to prevent or to respond to a uh, public emergency, that is clear. Uh, but there will need to be certain safeguards to assure that the requests by these authorities are motivated, they are proportionate and limited to, to what is necessary to a particular uh, situation. Um, now, according to the proposal, our understanding is that such exceptional need would exist when the data is needed to respond or to prevent to a public emergency. And then in addition to this, there is another case where the public body can invoke the provision when the lack of data prevents it from fulfilling a specific task in the public interest. Can you maybe explain a bit more what kind of instances uh, would be covered by, by this provision? Yeah, okay, no, thanks, thanks uh, for, for this question. So yeah, first of all, in, in general, well, it, it's very clear from the pandemic situation that showed that there is a need for a governance framework to allow public sector bodies to access certain data from companies in certain situations. And this is about the public sector bodies not getting the right data, but it's also about companies getting multiple requests for the same data from, from many different layers of government, right? And the need for streamlined procedures. Now, um, this situation exactly confirms what the high level expert group on business to government data sharing already said uh, in its report in 2020. Now, um, with the Data Act, we are harmonizing at EU level, business to government data sharing by providing rules for data sharing under emergency situations, but not only. Um, what we have in general is a quite limited and targeted mechanisms for cases where the public sector cannot get the data through normal procedures. So uh, what are the normal procedures? Well, it could be a law that has a reporting obligation. So you have to send in every year certain statistical data uh, to the statistical office, right? Certain data to the statistical office. It can also be a situation where there's procurement or where you buy the data in a normal market situation. So what we are doing here with the business to government proposal is actually tackling situation including emergencies where these normal mechanisms don't work. Now, I think for emergencies, this is quite clear, but your question is more about this other type of situations, right? Now, this indeed is for cases where the public sector really needs the, the data for fulfilling its task in the public interest in line uh, with its mandate that's explicitly provided in law. So this is the first condition that you mentioned in your question. And indeed the burden of proof is on, on the public sector body in these cases. Huh? But there's also a second condition and that second condition that can be fulfilled in two ways. So either the public sector body proves that it has done really everything to get the data by other means, for example, looking 
uh, whether it's available in the market or proc procurement procedures, or and that um, well, there's no time actually to have new reporting obligations introduced by law to actually get the relevant data. There is another possibility, which is that getting the data for the public sector body would lead to really a considerable uh, reduction of burden, administrative burden for companies. Uh, an example is uh, the um, statistical offices. They send out lots of questionnaires every, every year. Now, if getting the data directly that they need to actually, because they, they have to fulfill uh, their legislative task of producing certain statistics. If this task can be done in a much cheaper way for everyone by getting direct data streams from one or perhaps some companies, instead of sending questionnaires around to thousands of companies, that could also be one of these exceptional situations where actually you could start working with this before this is laid down in statistical legislation. So it's that kind of uh, situations we're talking about. Then there is a number of safeguards. So public sector bodies um, will have to, to demonstrate that their requests for the data are justified and based on exceptional needs as defined by the Data Act. And the request will also have to respect certain conditions to be admissible. You hinted at that, uh, notably regarding their proportionality and their transparency. Member states should assign uh, a competent authority that is responsible for business to government data sharing with the task also to handle disputes. So there is a possibility to say no and actually to say, hey, 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 what's happening here if you're not convinced by what, what is happening? Now, finally, the Data Act uh, will make it possible to streamline procedures to ensure that there will be less administrative burden for companies uh, who get all this kind of requests. Um, and uh, yeah, overall there, we think that we also find found a, a balance between the interest of the public sector to get more data and the interest of the companies that of course don't want to get requests uh, left and center that, that well, they sometimes cannot re uh, comply with. Thanks indeed, finding that balance will definitely be very important. Um, you know, we'll see probably in you know, the next steps how the details of this will, will be outlined, you know, what kind of authorities will be also in charge of you know, handling these situations and potential um, challenges from, from those companies that hold the data. There is a lot of interest around what happens in, in the sharing process and after the sharing process. There's, I think, a couple of questions uh, that are asking how the proposal is ensuring um, or clarifying liability issues. Uh, for example, what if the data is used for something else, something illegal? Uh, Sophie Som is asking from our audience. And connected to that, another question from Emmanuel Darmanin um, is asking what protection is there beyond the, the agreement that, 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 that we talked about before against the illicit use of the data is making the example of cybersecurity, you know, purposes and cyber, security, cyber attacks as, as well. Um, and maybe, well, there is another question that we can or cannot bundle um, up, up to you. And it's about how, you know, you share the data. Um, so what is that foreseen channel for sharing IoT data amongst the parties? Uh, how will the data be stored? Will cloud services be the, the the default choice or the only choice? You know, these are all, I think, very practical questions. So very interesting. Yeah, okay. Um, what if the user, the data is used illegally? Well, um, there's two scenarios here. One is indeed a scenario where actually the public sector uses the data for something illegal. That isn't, well, actually not, not, not the intention that that should not happen. Um, what we did exclude from the proposal is um, actually using the data for something which, which would be legal, which is law enforcement. But the idea is not that the data act uh, becomes another channel for the police, for example, to get data 
for law enforcement uh, purposes. But I think the illegal bit is perhaps more linked to um, leaks and what happens after the uh, the sharing process, right? So that's also linked to the question on protection and, and cyber security. And indeed, uh, the, the public sector bodies must ensure that there is a, a very high level of security in place. Now, just as, a, um, as an example, um, when the pandemic broke out, the European Commission asked the telcos uh, for mobility data. And we gave the data to our joint research center, which is part of the European Commission, that used the data to actually um, model what was the effect of mobility on the spread of COVID. And this helped um, the member states to take the right confinement or deconfinement measures. Now, we made sure that the uh, security around the data was at the highest level. There were only a few people who could actually access um, the data and it was separated from the rest of the of the commission uh, networks just to avoid indeed that the data uh, would get into the wrong hands, even if this was fully anonymized and aggregated data. So we are not talking about personal data, but non-personal data, but still uh, we made sure that all the security requirements were fully um, fulfilled. Now, um, the third question about the foreseen channel for IoT data. Uh, first of all, business to government data sharing goes beyond IoT data. It can be all kinds of data. I think that's an important point to make where the, the data access and use part of the proposal is mostly geared towards the IoT data, even though it also frames conditions for, for other types of data. Um, the business to government data sharing part is about all types of data that could be concerned. And there is no um, specific technological challenges, sorry, channels foreseen. And there's also um, no um, obligations in terms of using a specific storage medium foreseen. Um, there, we, we, we stayed neutral on the modalities on, on purpose, um, just uh, sketching out the, the main principles and what is fair in terms of who can access the data under what uh, circumstances. I acknowledge that, of course, there is a link uh, between the second and the third question. We must make sure that public sectors, when sector bodies, when they actually get the data, they um, treat the data and use the data in the highest uh, security conditions to make sure that the data is not, not leaked. One other um, consideration on this, we got um, some fears. It was already expressed in the business to government data sharing uh, high, uh, expert group that the data um, that the public sector body would get would become open data under the open data directive uh, because the public sector body would become a data holder and then it would it would be non-personal data and that, so we have to have been very explicit that this is not the case it's not as if if you are requested to give certain data for the fulfillment of the public tasks that suddenly this data would part of the would be part of the open data uh, thrust um, well that we have been pushing for years i mean the first open data directive at european level is from 2003 so um, we have done a lot on getting government data to the private sector and make sure that innovation can be built also on uh, publicly paid data. Now we're looking at the other direction, very specific cases where uh, the public sector may need private sector data to fulfill its public tasks. Let's stay on the business to government context for, for a second. There is another question that is uh, you know, partly linked to what you were saying, you know, is, is asking, um, what kind of data are we talking about? You know, are we talking about raw data and also whether companies would be required to, to treat, to process the data, to anonymize it, to analyze it before 
when they they get a request and they have to share it with public authorities. There was also another question on this that I think you you indirectly replied. You know, there was a question from Katarina asking if the scope for B2G is broader than B2B and B2C, but I think you've touched upon that a bit. Yeah, so um, in, in principle, we are talking about the raw data, but indeed uh, there may be a need for the anonymization uh, of the data in, in certain cases, because um, in, in practically all cases, we would talk about non-personal data that will be requested just in exceptional cases, uh, it could also be pseudonymized uh, uh, data, um, but that would indeed uh, require an anonymization process in certain in certain cases. Yes, that is foreseen. But in principle, it's the raw data. So it's not about insights that companies have already developed uh, themselves based on, on the data. Now, I'd like to move to, to one specific angle that has attracted attention from, I think, you know, some specific companies. Um, there is a, a very uh, specific reference in the proposal um, about the prohibition for those companies that have been designated as gatekeepers under the Digital Markets Act, which has been finalized. Uh, and so these companies would not be able to benefit from the provisions on, on data sharing. Um, so can you maybe tell us more about the logic behind it and will the ban apply only to the core platform services uh, under the scope of DMA? Uh, so some of the services provided by a gatekeeper or will this apply to the whole undertaking, all the services that a gatekeeper provides, even when they're not designated as gatekeeper for that specific service? Yeah, so the, the logic of the proposal is about giving the data poor uh, more access and better access to data in that sense it's really is a an sme instrument as i indicated before um so it it would therefore be disproportionate to facilitate access to to iot data for companies that um are already so data rich that it's sometimes seen as a as a problem and that is the issue of course that's being discussed in the context of the digital markets Markets Act. Um, so the Data Act is an enabling instrument for um, for the users and for smaller and medium-sized enterprises to get access to the data. And um, it seems logical in that sense that um, the the right um, to benef the benefits of the right to access the data is not extended to uh, gatekeeper companies, uh, where one of the issues is indeed uh, the use of data and leveraging the data across the different markets. And um, as you indicated, indeed, uh, this would not only apply to the gatekeeper services, but it would apply to the, to the companies um, as a whole. Uh, that's that's what in the the data act proposal now this does not mean that the gatekeepers uh, and the companies around it are prohibited to to use in any way iot data it simply says they cannot benefit from the right that is established uh, by the data act these are two separate things and that they're sometimes conflated and misunderstood thanks for that clarification um you know, we can expect, I think, some discussions around those provisions. Um, we, I think it would be interesting to move on to the international um, dimension of the Data Act. And there's, I think, also a lot of questions in the chat. Um, one, one question uh, is about uh, whether the Data Act would also allow a non-European participant in a B2B situation. So for example, you know, will the Data Act actually have a similar mechanism for an adequacy decision like the one under the GDPR? Um, and also, you know, let me let me now turn, there is a question from one of our colleagues at ITI um, that is asking, you know, given the, the provisions on, on the, the goal on fairness, um, you know, he, he's pointing, John Miller is pointing to the fact that the proposal is including 
fairly strict restrictions on international data sharing, uh, including rules that seem to be somewhat stricter to the requirements uh, um, on transfers of personal data as has been outlined by the EDPB following the Trans2 ruling. Um, so, you know, I think there is the perception is that the net effect of these restrictions in the Data Act might be that, that there is a decrease in the overall data sharing access and use within the EU because of the international dimension as well. Can you, can you, you know, explain a little bit about that? Yeah, no, sure. So let me, me first get into the question about whether adequacy decisions are, are foreseen. Um, no, that is not foreseen in, in the Data Act. Now, the, um, this idea that there are very strict restrictions that actually would hamper data flows. I don't share that. So let me first try to say what the Data Act is doing and then what it's, it's not doing. So the Data Act um, with its Article 27, which is very similar to Article 30 of the Data Governance Act, is trying to avoid that um, intelligence services of third countries get access to European data in conflict with European law uh, based on unilaterally imposed rules by that third country, right? So that is what it's doing. Now, if there is a treaty between uh, Europe and the third country, um, then obviously, things are okay. But what we want to avoid is that European data um, is being accessed by third country intelligence services without uh, having um, the right possibilities to appeal for the, the European uh, data holders that are actually affected by this kind of situations. So this is about third country government access. This does not affect um, data flows um, between, between private companies. So I would like to, to take away this misperception that this is going to in somehow uh, stifle data flows. No, this is really about the specific case of um, third country um, access to, to data when the access shouldn't be there because it's contrary to European law. Now, the same provision was part of the Data Governance Act for a slightly different uh, group of actors that were concerned. And it, um, it passed the co-legislation procedure, Parliament and Council, in an almost unchanged form from the Commission proposal, which shows that there is a quite strong uh, political will behind this um, from all sides to avoid this kind of situation. But I don't think it, it should be and can be spun into a data localization or a data uh, movement restriction uh, measure uh, as I some, sometimes hear, hear it being done. Thanks, Thank, thanks really for, for, for that explanation. Uh, it's, it's extremely helpful. Um, now I'm trying to handle a lot of questions that are coming through the chat. It's great to see so much interest. Um, uh, so you will forgive me if I kind of jump a little bit, uh, but I think, you know, there is, a, um, you, you talked about the data spaces and, you know, their role also in this context. There's a question from one of the attendees um, asking if you can elaborate on the commission objectives in relation to the data spaces and what the operators of data spaces in chapter nine uh, mean uh, and entail. Okay, yeah, there's, there's a bit to, to unpack there. Um, so there is the, the question of the interoperability, which is indeed um, in, the, in the interoperability uh, chapter. But then there is the, the broader issue of what we want to do with the, the data spaces. Now, first of all, why do we have data spaces? Because when we discussed the, um, the data strategy, we realized that a one size fits all approach for all the different sectors uh, may not be the most productive one in all cases. So you have to take into account that there are differences between the different sectors. So health data has different governance, different types of data also compared to industrial data. 
right? And that's why we work with the concept of data spaces, where uh, we work with constituencies, well, uh, that have more homogeneous types of data. And actually what we try to do with the, the data spaces is to make sure that there are governance mechanisms within sectors or subsectors, and that there's also a data infrastructure available. Now, of course, we have to avoid that by working with sectors, we create new silos. So there, the um, interoperability that has been set up in the Data Innovation Board under the Data Governance Act is already very important. Uh, the Data Innovation Board should help to avoid that we create new silos in the data spaces by working on interoperability across the board. Now, your, your question is about uh, the requirements for operators of data spaces um, who would actually have to comply with, with certain minimum requirements in terms of, of interoperability. Now, I think this is going to be one of the, uh, the issues that will uh, lead to further discussion in the Parliament and Council um, is the uh, formulation that we found there, the operators of the data spaces, is that really the right, um, the right group of people that we are targeting here in terms of the interoperability requirements? Should it be rather the orchestrators of data spaces or actually the data holders within, within data spaces? So I expect further discussions on this specific uh, element uh, because of the, the use of this word word operators, uh, that has triggered a number of questions and we see it again today. So we've, um, we're about three minutes out uh, before the end of the conversation. I think there is one interesting area that is about the architecture and the enforcement and the role of member states. I'll, I'll go there in a second, but there is a question that I really like in the chat, very straightforward from Francesco is asking in the B2B, B2C context, uh, can mandatory data sharing be remunerated? So users paying data holders or should the data sharing be for free in principle? So the, um, the situation where you as the user of an object get the data, you will get it for free, right? The situation where you say, okay, a third party, uh, my preferred repair company, gets direct access to the data through the service of the manufacturer, there is a payment involved. So that is the situation. Now, this payment um, is going to be cost-based for SMEs, and it will be basically market-based for uh, non-SMEs. So then it has to be agreed between the data holder and uh, the third party who uses the data. So that is the construction. So yes, there is a payment foreseen for uh, third party access because indeed maintaining the infrastructure has a cost. Um, but there is a differentiation there between SMEs and uh, non-SMEs. That's very interesting, thanks. So as I, as I anticipated, I think you know, there is a lot also to unpack in relation to uh, the enforcement. Um, so let me ask you this probably maybe last question. Um, about the role of member states, you know, that they, they will be involved and responsible for the enforcement of the Data Act and also for laying down rules on penalties for in case of infringement. Can you tell us more about the mechanisms that will be put in place and how, we, you know, how it's important to avoid fragmented approaches to enforcement? Yeah, indeed. So, so here we have tried to find a balance between having a, a solid enforcement mechanism in place for the different areas and telling member states exactly how they have to set up their enforcement mechanisms, right? Which it's, it's always a delicate balance because if you um, try to tell member states how they have to set up certain enforcement mechanisms, you um, get the question and rightly so, but, but we have already something which is very similar. Can't we use that as a basis? So what we define in the Data Act proposal is a number of functions that have to be fulfilled. But we did um, put a lot of care into this because indeed um, the functioning of the Data Act proposal and the Data Act, once it's adopted, will depend on 
a proper enforcement mechanism. So member states will have to designate competent authorities for the enforcement of different elements and the different elements are nominated uh, in the proposal, they're, they're listed in the proposals. And there will also be uh, a possibility for individuals and also companies to lodge complaints to those authorities. So there will be an authority responsible for B2G, there will be an authority responsible for um, the B2B and the B2C data sharing for the, for the cloud elements, the cloud switching elements. Um, and we think that this is a flexible, but at the same time, solid tool uh, to make sure that yes, there must be people responsible for enforcing because if not, yeah, you have a, a legislate, legislation that's perhaps uh, not really well happening in practice. On the other hand, we don't want to be too prescriptive to the member states on the means of how to do things because that may not fit uh, with things that exist already. And we want also to avoid administrative burden in that sense. Thanks for, for that context. Um, now we are one minute past 5 p.m. and I wish we had more time. There were so many questions. Uh, so we'd really like to thank you on behalf of ITI, on behalf of our audience, uh, Ivo, for joining us for this conversation. Uh, we really appreciate the time you spent with us and you know all the, 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 the description, explanation, responses that you provided. We will continue to work with the European Commission, the Parliament and Council as the data act move forward. Uh, and you know, I expect we may not agree on everything, but you know, we want to keep the dialogue open, we want to be constructive. Uh, so thanks again. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm sure there will be other opportunities, other events. Uh, this proposal will be dissected from every angle, I'm sure. So there's a lot of discussion moving forward. So thanks all, thanks, Ivo. Uh, for more information on ITI's work, please take the time to visit us at itic.org to learn more. Uh, thank you all for joining, for all your interesting questions, and we look forward to seeing you next.